Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the CCSP study session. We're going to have these regularly and these study sessions are designed to help uh, supplement your existing study endeavors. They're help, going to help you just focus on a few key topics. If you have any topics that you'd like to focus on or you want to ask questions or anything, just feel free to type it in the chat. I'll try to get, do my best to answer all the questions uh, from the YouTube chat, from uh, other chat channels. So just feel free to ask whatever you like. We're going to focus on domains one and two uh, for the CCSP exam. And I want to start with uh, VPNs. I want to talk about a VPN concentrator, how it works, and how it's used in a cloud environment. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dennis Kraft. I'm the head instructor at Cybercraft Training. And I'm the instructor for the CCSP course. This course will teach you everything you need to know for the Certified Cloud Security Professional exam. And today we're going to go over a few topics covering domains one and two. Domains one and two of six domains for the CCSP course. We're going to focus on cloud data security, which is the primary focus of domain two. So I'd like to talk about a VPN concentrator. A uh, virtual private network is a network that allows you to uh, create a private connection or encrypted connection between either a, a corporate network or an organization's network and an individual device that has remotely dialed in. There's also other types of VPNs that connect, connect two different networks, but in a cloud security sense, we're mostly talking about uh, VPNs that work within from one network to individual devices. So this is obviously a means to protect data confidentiality. Remember back to that CIA triad that we always harp on, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The VPN concentrator is a mechanism for protecting confidentiality. We have two main types of VPN. A remote access VPN is what most people are familiar with. It's a method for connecting an endpoint like a laptop or a desktop to a cloud server or to a corporate network. If you've worked in a, a government setting or if you've worked with a large corporation and you've ever had to work while traveling or work remotely, then you're aware of how a VPN works and those types of VPNs are remote access VPNs. There's also a site-to-site -site VPN. A site-to-site -site VPN will connect two local area networks. So it's a way to extend uh, organization's secure network to another office per se. This is very useful for say a company that has uh, geographically dispersed holdings but they want to extend their network across those holdings. With a site-to-site -site VPN and a remote access VPN there's a the two main differences, well, first off, one's between two networks and one's between an endpoint and a network. And secondly, with a remote access VPN, each individual user needs to dial into the VPN. In a site-to-site, -site, if you're part of the network that has been connected, every user within that network can automatically access the resources of the other network. They don't have to individually sign in or connect through a VPN. A very common protocol used for VPNs is IP security or IPsec. IPsec is a protocol suite, so it's a, a group of protocols, and this is designed to provide encrypted communication, both for remote and for site-to-site -site VPNs. IPsec has a mode, uh, transport mode and tunnel mode, two different modes with IPsec. In transport mode, it's the basic mode where just the payload of the message is protected. In tunnel mode, what actually happens is you create a VPN or you create a tunnel that protects not only the payload, but also the routing and the header information, which provides an additional level of anonymity 
for users connecting through that VPN. IPsec includes an authentication header, usually abbreviated AH, and encapsulated security payload. So how IPsec works, you have first the user, say, is connecting to a web application. The first uh, device will request an IPsec connection. And then the second device or the web application will then provide uh, information back to determine the handshake process and the hashes, the encryption algorithms, etc. Then in step three, each device is going to agree upon those parameters, the security association, and that's going to determine what's used for inbound and outbound connections. And then with those parameters set, the devices are going to communicate. Also with VPNs, you have what's called a split tunnel or a full tunnel. So a split tunnel VPN only secures uh, selective traffic. Usually it's just like HTTP traffic or internet traffic or whatever traffic that the organization deems necessary to protect. So, and oftentimes uh, HTTP traffic might be left off or connections to certain services like Facebook or LinkedIn. Those would be not pushed through the VPN to save company resources and bandwidth, but any SharePoint connections or any connections to uh, a FTP server within the company, those would be pushed through the VPN. And the, a split tunnel VPN can differentiate between the different types of connections and then provide only selective encryption. A full tunnel VPN encrypts all traffic. All internet traffic will go through the full tunnel VPN. It's a little more robust. And there are some exploits with a split tunnel, tunnel VPN to take advantage and fool the VPN into thinking that certain traffic is legitimate or certain traffic is illegitimate and there's some security loopholes that can be uh, taken advantage of there. Also when it comes to a VPN or a secure connection from a cloud server or within a cloud environment you often hear transport layer security or secure sockets layer SSL. Transport layer security is simply the upgraded version of Secure Sockets Layer. Secure Sockets Layer is now obsolete. It's been replaced with Transport Layer Security, but since it's been around for so long, you still hear people say Secure Sockets Layer or SSL. Uh, right, it's still, right now it's Transport Layer Security. That's the modern uh, protocol, but SSL is still gonna be in the vernacular. So transfer layer security is a symmetric key algorithm. It's used to secure a session, and most commonly it's used to secure, to secure uh, connections to a website or web application. The encryption key is generated uniquely for each connection, so it provides a secure session each time a user connects. And the uh, algorithms that have been used throughout the years have changed, but currently they're using Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which you don't really need to know for the exam. The inner workings of those, just be aware that Diffie-Hellman is a symmetric key encryption algorithm that's used for transfer layer security. Okay, so transfer layer security relies on certificate authorities, which I'm going to be explaining here. And those certificate authorities uh, issue certificates to different websites so that the websites can be listed as trusted. Okay, so let's talk about how that works. So you have a certificate authority. I know this is kind of a lot to go on, but we're going to talk about it. The first step here is going to be that the, the certificate authority adds a root certificate to a browser company's root certificate store. Okay. Now this is going to happen when the certificate authority has initially established themselves. Certificate authorities are only as good as the number of companies or the number of browsers they can support. So these browser 
these browser companies, basically like Google with Chrome or Mozilla with Firefox, Internet Explorer, and you have Safari or uh, those different browsers each have their own root certificate store. Okay, and these stores store the trusted root certificate from certificate authorities. So certificate authorities will actually petition these companies to have their trusted root certificate listed on that root certificate store because then their certificates can be accepted by those browsers. Okay, so that step happens when the, the CA or the certificate authority is initially set up. So after that, you'll get an individual website that's set up and that website wants to conduct secure traffic with their users. So that website will go, instead of going all the way to the browser, the website will talk to the CA, the certificate authority, and ask for a TLS certificate. Okay, and then the CA will evaluate the website and then provide them with a TLS certificate. That TLS certificate has been signed by the certificate authority. So now, when a user contacts a website, the user is initiating a TLS session. Okay, and to show that the website's trustworthy, the website passes off that transfer layer security certificate to the browser. Now, the user using the browser is not going to know right off the bat if that certificate is trustworthy, okay? I mean, a website could just do what, use what's called a self-signed certificate. They could just make a certificate for themselves and sign it themselves and then pass it off as a real certificate. So how do you ensure that certificates are trustworthy? You check the browser's root certificate store. And this is where that first step comes into play. The browser is going to determine if that root certificate, TLS certificate that they received is actually trustworthy. And if it is, then the session continues with the agreed upon parameters using uh, the TLS protocol. So that's how TLS works in a nutshell. And I think if you understand this process, especially this diagram, then you have a good understanding for the exam. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the study guide here. So, Domain 2, Cloud Data Security. We're talking about different methods of storing data and securing data, and then also methods for conducting, uh, protecting that data in transit and also data at rest. So I'd like to go over just another Okay, let's talk a little bit about data at rest. So data at rest is encrypted with an encryption method. Usually there's a couple different methods in use. The most popular are advanced encryption standard or AES. And that AES comes in different bit sizes. You see, most commonly see AES 128, 192, or 256, okay? AES has very good protection, particularly against timing attacks. It's a particular attack that uh, targets different uh, encryption algorithms. And it has a very low memory requirement, so it can be applied quickly and it can do decryption quick, uh, quickly to retrieve data. Blowfish is another very good option, usually used by corporations as opposed to the federal government, which will use AES. Blowfish is an open source. Uh, algorithm and it comes in 64 uh, bit block sizes but it supports up to 440 bit so blowfish and AES are the ones you'll most likely see and those are both 
uh, for encryption of data at rest or data that's stored on say a cloud server or on a hard drive. We talked about symmetric encryption like TLS then asymmetric encryption on the flip side is uh, where symmetric encryption uses the same encryption key asymmetric encryption will use what's called a public key and a private key. So an asymmetric key or asymmetric encryption say I have a encryption key. I have a private key and a public key. The public key I can give out to anybody and anyone can have a copy. Anybody who encrypts a message with my public key, the public key that's available to anybody, that message can only be read by me because my private key is the only thing that can decrypt that message. So in that sense, a user can send a message that can only be received by me. Anybody else who receives that message or intercepts that message will be unable to decrypt it. With a, uh, on the flip side, if I encrypt something with my private key, the key that I don't share with anyone, and I send out that message, everybody can decrypt it because everybody has access to my public key. So what this means is that anyone can decrypt the message, but if they're able to decrypt the message with my public key, they know that message has come from me because the only way they can decrypt it with that public key is if I first encrypted it with my private key. In this sense, the only thing that's being protected here is data integrity because you are ensuring that the message has not been tampered with. If any data was altered in that message, you would be unable to decrypt it with that public key of mine. Public key infrastructure is a common uh, encryption method used within organizations. And it's the modern framework that allows most businesses to encrypt uh, their connection to cloud servers. So public key infrastructure will combine symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So what you'll have is the data or the data payload will be encrypted with a symmetric key. Now the problem with encrypting with a symmetric key is how do you give the key to both parties? Because a symmetric key algorithm is very secure. Only people with that key can decrypt the data. So if you only have two people or the participants in a session with a copy of that key, then that data is very secure. Anybody who intercepts that data will be unable to decrypt it. Okay. But the question is, how do you share that key in the first place? Because if you can't just email the key with the message, the message is going to be intercepted and then the key will be intercepted and the message can be decrypted. So you have to share the key ahead of time. Now PKI lets you share the key with uh, an asymmetric encryption so that you can then use the symmetric key to decrypt the actual message. Okay. So let's uh, talk about that. And explain it a little bit. Okay. So if we have an encryption key, And we want to share this between two parties. In order to do that, we want to first share the message itself with uh, an asymmetric key. Okay. So we would use the methods I talked about previously 
to share a message and ensure that the message is coming from an individual person and then with that asymmetric method ensure that uh, we've shared that private key or that asymmetric or that symmetric key and then once that symmetric key is shared then the message can continue and the communication can be secure. So PKI uses uh, an already established framework to ensure that that key is shared ahead of time and that users are able to determine like we talked about before with the certificate authority determine who has what level of trust or if someone has a certificate provided by the certificate authority then they can be trusted so let's go back to our example from earlier Okay, so here we have, in our example, we're using a website, right? But this can be just a company web server. This can be another user. This trusted entity is still going to use the same method to share this uh, TLS certificate, okay? So in this sense, the TLS certificate or the, for the TLS session is a symmetric key. But what we're doing here is we're using an asymmetric method, an asymmetric encryption algorithm to share that key in the first place. Because how this certificate is verified is that the certificate authority uses their public key to sign the TLS certificate. So you see this little seal here, that's being signed with the certificate authority's public key. Once it's signed with the public key, the way the browser verifies it is by checking the TLS certificate against the certificate authority's private key and that private key is stored in the browser's root certificate store. So in this sense the browser or the user will know that that TLS certificate has come from the certificate authority. The certificate authority was the one that authorized it because it can be decrypted using the uh, the private key of the certificate authority which has been stored in the root certificate store. I hope that makes sense and if you have any questions please please ask because it's it's a complex issue and it's a complex topic but if you understand it especially the first time you're gonna you're gonna be very well off for the exam so Okay, going back to VPNs, there's a, we talked about some VPNs. There's a newer type of VPN called OpenVPN. I mean, it's newer, but it's developed in 2001. Okay, and this is an open source method of VPN that supports different encryption algorithms like AES and Blowfish, uh, as opposed to just transport layer security VPNs or other types of VPNs. VPNs, OpenVPN is actually very good for multiple connections. Uh, it's a method for providing uh, an organization with many different VPN options. So just remember OpenVPN as a VPN, as a way to conduct and set up a VPN. All right. So we talked about encryption keys, session keys, and the keys with the certificate authority. Now, 
protecting the certificate authority or protecting those cryptographic keys is one of the main concerns when it comes to protecting data at rest because if you don't protect your encryption keys then an attacker you know, an attacker who gets your encryption keys is going to decrypt your data okay so you need to protect your encryption keys you need to protect them commensurate to the level of encryption that you've uh, that you're protecting the data with so if you have an AES 256 bit key and you protect that key or you encrypt that key in an encryption folder that uses AES 128 you're effectively encrypting your data with AES 128 bit because all the user the attacker needs to do is decrypt that 128 bit to gain access to two, the AES 256 bit keys so the lowest level encryption in your organization that protects your keys is the level of protection that's basically applied to all of your data if that makes sense it's like the weakest link in the chain you can't encrypt your data at a certain level of encryption like AES 256 and then encrypt the keys at a lower level it just doesn't make sense or store your keys unencrypted and very often many cloud breaches are perpetrated by companies just storing their encryption keys unencrypted or with poor encryption so to get around this or to help organizations protect their keys uh, their company is called cloud access security brokers or CASP CASP basically do key escrow they control the keys for the organization they secure the keys they encrypt the keys and because they're a third party that allows the uh, automatically allows the organization to store their encryption keys outside of where the data is stored so say you have a organization that provides cloud data storage okay instead of that organization storing their own keys within their own cloud data store they can use a CASP and that CASP will have this, the keys somewhere else so CASPs are very cost efficient and they adhere to the cloud principles of scalability because they allow uh, organizations to implement uh, PKI or identity access management solutions without having to invest in the hardware invest in the personnel and the resources to properly store their keys they just simply hire a CASP we talk about encrypting data at rest with AES 256 and Blowfish There's also a newer form of encryption called homomorphic encryption and homomorphic encryption allows users to manipulate encrypted data without taking it out of an encrypted state it's still in the research phase but you may see a question of this on the CCSP exam so it's good to be aware of it there's also whole distance whole instance encryption where say you have a virtual uh, cloud desktop okay a user would log in that desktop conduct their work like office 256 or 365 sorry I got 256 on the brain office 365 uh, that entire desktop instance can be encrypted when the user logs off and this will ensure that you know it protects the data it protects the instance it protects that snapshot and it, all you need to know is it's just a method of protecting a virtualized instance by providing encryption for that instance and clearly this is just used for virtual environments Data obfuscation is also called data masking, and this is a method of protecting data from basically employees from insider threat. Okay, so say you have someone working at a banking industry, and that banking industry uses a web application that users can log into to do online banking. If a user has a question, they might call in to the uh, site or to you know to the bank 
And when they do that, they're going to talk to a customer service representative. That customer service representative is going to talk to them about their accounts, etc. To ensure that customer service representative doesn't isn't exposed today they shouldn't be, you can use data masking. And what that will do is that will mask to the customer service representative certain amounts of data and only show, say, you know, the last four characters of the bank account. All right, oh, this is bank account ending in this number. Or uh, you have your social security number ends in this. And the other characters will come up as either hash marks or asterisks or nothing. Okay, so if it comes up as nothing, it's considered a null. Sometimes they're replaced with random characters. It's called randomization. Sometimes you use other entities within the data set. That's called shuffling. That's really a least preferable method because you're actually using real data. And there is a chance that you could actually get the real number. Uh, and then data masking as a general term usually just means replacing it with some sort of character like an asterisk or like an X. But this is a method to protect against insider threats and against uh, data exfiltration or theft of data by employees. A hash is a one-way encrypted encryption or a cryptographic function. It's a one-way cryptographic function that creates what's known as a hash of the original data. Okay, it's a cryptographic hash. This is a method of protecting data integrity. Whenever you apply a hash to data, what or you apply this uh, algorithm, the hashing algorithm, you're going to get a hash. If that data is changed at all and you apply the cryptographic algorithm again, you will get a different hash, okay? So if you compare the two hashes and they're different, you know that the data has changed somewhat. If you're storing data for, say, long-term storage, it's always a good idea to apply a cryptographic hash when you initially store the data. And then when you retrieve the data, you can do a hash again and see if that data or that hash has changed at all. If it has, you may have had some data degradation. The data may have deteriorated while in storage, just loss of bits or some electrical errors. This happens to data, especially over time. So if you use these hashes, you can be aware of that and then understand you may need to repair the data in some manner. A hash is also very useful when downloading files or transferring files over the internet. Say you send a file through email, you can apply the hash a cryptographic hash and then show the hash or paste the hash with the email. Then the user who retrieves the email can download the, can take the file, apply a cryptographic hash on their end and compare the two hash values. If they're the same, they know they're getting the same file. This can protect against man in the middle attacks where an attacker would intercept the message and change the, uh, the data. Though at the same time with a man in the middle attack, if they've intercepted the message, they can also change what the hash reads in the in the email so but uh, say you're downloading a file from a website that website can list the hash there and as a user when you download the file you can apply a cryptographic hash on your end get your hash value and compare it to what the website's listed and ensure you get the right download all right let's move on with a different topic for domain two, I think we covered obfuscation, we covered CAS, some encryption of data at rest. Let's see. Bring your own device policy. Let's we can talk about that a bit. And data discovery. Let's go ahead and talk about those.
Okay, storage types. So there's a couple different storage types for data at rest. We have ephemeral disks. These are disks that are created as needed. So you have a virtual instance and you need to boot that instance and provide resources for that instance. You'll create uh, what's known as an ephemeral disk, a disk that is only alive for the duration of the instance. Once that instance is closed, the data, the state data of the instance is saved, that disk can shut down. It's no longer needed to run the instance. Okay. <laughs> then you have raw disk space. Raw disk space is just simply unallocated storage space. This is a uh, storage space can, that can then be allocated for virtual instances or for data storage. It's basic raw storage. Uh, persistence disks are it's a type of virtual block storage that segments data into different components known as blocks. Okay, and these blocks can then be attributed to different resources. So the data is allocated first into different segments, the segments known as blocks, and then those blocks are recruited as needed and assigned where they could be uh, used. A storage bucket is a method of object storage, okay, where the data and the metadata any of the data is stored as objects and those objects are then stored in a single repository the objects themselves are identified by the organization and different pieces of information can be identified as objects to further uh, categorize them and then store them better and then file storage is where you have data it's all stored as a single piece within a specific file. Hardware storage, a couple of different types. You have traditional hard disks where you have a spinning component. And we're talking about the physical component now where you have a spinning disk and data is written onto that disk as needed. Then you have a newer technology, solid state drives. It's not exactly new. It's common practice now where the data has no spinning component. Solid state drives are much more stable. They're more, uh, they're less prone to hardware failures because you don't have any mechanical spinning components. And when you delete data from a solid state drive, that data is permanently deleted. When you delete data from a hard disk, that data is allocated for deletion and it may be overwritten but it would need to be overwritten several different times for data for, to be permanently deleted. Uh, you still have residual information on hard drives that can be later recalled. So in a cloud environment, it's less ideal to have that type of storage if you have information that is... Uh... So because of this, okay, you have a hard disk drive use in cloud storage. As a customer, as a cloud customer, to protect your data confidentiality, it's, it's not adequate enough just to delete the data. Okay, If you delete your data off your cloud storage, that really won't do you any good because that data has a chance to be recovered. Okay, it might You don't know the architecture with your uh, cloud service provider or you might not know. You might not know what type of disk is being used. If it's a traditional hard disk and you simply delete the data and you look at your cloud data storage, say you're going to another company or you're just removing files from the cloud uh, storage, you delete that data and you think, okay, looks deleted. I don't see anything on my cloud storage file. I'm good to go. That might not be the case because that data may be recoverable later. To protect your confidentiality, you need to destroy data in a process known as crypto shredding. Crypto shredding is where you first apply a heavy encryption algorithm to your data. And then you can delete the data, or you can just leave it there. But once it's encrypted, then it's effectively useless to anyone else. 
So crypto shredding is the only method that ensures your data is actually protected. Your confidentiality is protected. Then when it comes to long-term storage, you have uh, magnetic disks or magnetic tapes. And these are still used even today because they're very cost effective. So what you're going to do is you're going to, you basically write the data onto uh, magnetic tape if you've worked in a, a storage center or if you've conducted backups of a company's data set, you may have worked with tapes before. It's, it seems adequated, antiquated, and it seems uh, obsolete. But because of the materials used, it's actually very cost efficient to do so. And then these tapes can be archived, they can be tapped, they're lightweight, they store well, they're not uh, super prone to degradation like a traditional hard drive is. So the tapes are a very good long-term storage relation solution that's cheap. When it comes to disk decay, I think the hard drive disks, the traditional HDDs are the most prone to disk decay over time. Not only due to the mechanical failure of the spinning component, but also due to just the materials used and the data integrity errors that can occur over time. Solid state drives are much more stable and tapes are, for their price, a very stable solution. All right, when it comes to storing your data, you wanna be able to organize it well. And that's where data classification comes in. Data classification is basically organizing your data so you could find it again. So there's a couple of different methods to do this. Labeling is applying tags to your data. And this these tags can be used to later find that data. And these can be defined by the organization, these labels. okay? And they will be applied when the data is created. So you might have a tag for each department within your organization. I say your human resources department stores data on personnel. That could have its own tag. Or your sales team might have uh, sales data. That could have a sales tag. You might also have data that is uh, sensitive to the company. Okay, so say you make, you have a company that makes widgets or doodads. Okay, those widgets or doodads, their design, uh, anything with research and development, might be a sensitive topic for your company, might be a trade secret. So you might want to apply a certain data label to any data that type. You might have a certain machine or a system that performs a certain function within the company. And you might want to say any data that comes from that type of machine or that system will automatically apply a data label to any data it processes because of the sensitivity of that data. <laughs> So these need to be defined by the organization. And a basic example could be like name, cost, or age, or uh, geographical location. Those could be data labels. And they'll be attached to the data, and they can be then, the data can then be searched for and organized very quickly and efficiently. Mapping is the process of creating relationships between two sets of data okay so in this way you're identifying a relationship you're identifying how different data sets uh, combine it lets two data sets interact okay so say you have a list of names right and then you have a list of, say you're a sales team you have a list of names or contacts okay and then you have a list of companies that you work with. Say you've received this list of uh, names and this list of companies from two different sources, but you know there's some overlap. Say the list of names are employees from the different companies, but you as a human being know that, but the computer does not know that, okay? So in order to interact those two pieces of data and organize them to create a relationship between those two data sets, you're going to use what's known as mapping. Okay, you're going to identify how those those data sets interact. And in this sense, you're going to say, okay, these names are employees of this company. So names relate to company 
names as an object, company as an object, how do those two relate? Uh, the, this name is an employee of this company. It's just a basic example. You're just telling a system or a computer system how to interact with two different data sets and how those interact. And you're, you're providing a rule set or a parameter for that system to merge those data fields. We talked about sensitive data and how data labeling can help protect sensitive data because once you apply a label, you can go through other security steps. You have a data label, you can then apply security uh, like data loss prevention strategies for any data of that label. You can apply encryption for data at rest for data that has that label. Say it's sales leads. You have sales leads, that's a data label. Anything involving sales leads in your company, you encrypt using AES 128-bit encryption for data at rest. If you are talking about sales leads or you're conducting communications regarding sales leads, you communicate using a secure encryption channel or a VPN if you're outside the corporate network. Those could be your policies and your rules that you apply to protect that data label. <laughs> and you might even have, say in the government sense, predefined labels like classified data, unclassified, confidential, secret, and top secret. So confidential, secret, and top secret are classification levels and those already have predetermined protection guidelines associated with them that have been defined by the federal government. Okay, data discovery. This is how you find data later to conduct uh, processing on it or to manipulate the data. <coughs> and you have two different types. Main categories of data. You have what's called structured data. Structured data can be mapped to a relational database. Okay, That's the main way to define structured data. So if you can say we talked about earlier sales leads or names and companies. Those can be fields within a database. You can have names. You can have companies. These are usually text files. Something can be described with text. Uh, and then those can be mapped together. They can be placed into a database like a SQL database, a structured query language database as opposed to unstructured data. Unstructured data is data that's not really text-based. Uh, it can't really have relationships attached to it. This is like images or sound files or videos. Th these are all things that are unstructured unless you... They're not something that can be manipulated and given a relationship to other types of data. Then you have label-based label uh, data, which we talked about applying labels to your data, and then you have metadata base. These are the data discovery methods. So you, you can discover things, you can discover your data or perform searches on your data based on the data labels. You can also do it based on the metadata, different file sizes. Uh, the file type. So say different image files you want to find within an organization. You want to find PNG uh, or you want to find JPEGs. You want to find JPEGs of a certain image size or a certain file size. You want to find files that were made between September of 2018 and October of 2019. You can also search based on patterns or search items, okay? So <laughs> these can be uh, different attributes of how the data was created or how the data has been used. You can use search terms to find different snippets, say the, the title of the data, or items, say text descriptors within the data itself. <laughs> when it comes to analyzing the data, this is where your performing searches on data, not only searches, but you're trying to interpret the results of large data sets. Data mining 
is where you process large amounts of data and you're looking for trends, you're looking for patterns, uh, you're trying to find some information of value from analyzing this large amount of uh, data. So say you're a company that gives information on stock to stockbrokers. Your data mining might involve looking at the number of shares that have been sold per day of these types of stocks, okay? Or say you're a golfing company and you wanna provide stats on different golfers and how they have performed. You might say, okay, these golfers have done you know, par four at this golf course, at this hole, and this is the trend of golfers of this age range versus this age range. And you're collecting data, you're trying to find something of value. You might provide that information to like a golf club manufacturer to provide a targeted ad. It's just basically taking large amounts of data and processing it into something that's useful, finding a useful trend or useful piece of information. Real-time analytics, it's a similar process, but this is done in real time. All right, personally, we talked about data, we talked about how to classify data, how to search for data, and how to analyze data. Now let's talk about other types of data that have been defined based on laws and regulations. Personally identifiable information is information that is used to identify an individual. Okay, this is a privacy law defined uh, term. These include social security numbers, addresses, phone numbers, emails, any little piece of information and piece of information that can, can be combined with others, it's like an address on its own, might not be of concern, but when you combine address and phone number and name, then now that's a concern. Uh, these are piece of information can be used to identify an individual. Protected health information, this is information that's been defined by HIPAA, or the Health Insurance uh, Portability and Accountability Act. This includes PII and includes information like health records, insurance information, and different uh, health account numbers. For finance, you have what's known as a payment card industry data security standard, PCI DSS. This is a set of standards agreed upon by major credit card companies. Okay, and they, these credit card companies have set requirements for security for organizations that process credit card information. So if you process credit card information, you should be in compliance with PCI DSS according to this agreed upon set of standards. And if you fail to comply, you may, your ability to process credit card information may be revoked. Though, even though there's a set of standards, it doesn't ensure proper compliance. And there's many instances where companies flaunt the regulations or get by with minimum requirements or requirements that are inadequate and they continue to process information. That's, where, that's why credit card fraud is uh, so prevalent. It's one of the reasons. All right. I think that was a good overview of our data sources. Let's see. We've talked about data discovery methods, real-time analytics, storage types, data classification based on business function or organization, uh, organization defined roles, labels. Yeah. So I think we're going to wrap up this study session. We've been going for about an hour now. Are there any questions? so far before we uh, sign off here. Information rice management. Okay. All right, so what is information rights management and what 
Let me talk about this real quick. All right, the question was, uh, what's information rights management? I've never heard of that. And that's fine. It's not as well known as uh, digital rights management, but we're going to, let's talk about it real quick. So information rights management, it's, it's basically a subset of digital rights management, okay? So where digital rights management protects uh, primarily like video files and uh, audio files, you know, songs and whatnot, information rights management provides protection for text files, okay, like emails, um, uh, PDFs. So this will protect certain pieces of information within the PDF or within the document, within the email, and you can apply rules for the document itself, okay? And those rules will remain consistent even if that document is shared. So for example, you might have on a PDF where the user is only allowed to select 10 lines of text at a time. This is trying to prevent the user from copying the entire document and then pasting it somewhere else to basically plagiarize the document or use that information elsewhere. It's going to make it more difficult for the user to do so. Or certain pieces of the document are obscured or they're, you can only gain access to the document if you have the correct uh, password. That's a method of information rights management. It's designed to protect information even regardless of where that information is passed. So it's imagine having like a locked briefcase with the documents inside. Only people with the right access, with the right key, can access that briefcase and read the documents. Every time they pass it off, the briefcase goes with it. I hope that answered your question. Okay, are there any more questions before we wrap up? Uh, Bill asks, I've taken the test before and the scenario-based questions are the ones that I've failed at. Yes, and that is the main catch with these types of exams, particularly ISC squared exams. Uh, the scenario-based questions, it's basically the entire exam is covered with scenario-based questions. The CCSP course that we offer at Cybercraft Training, we, I've handcrafted these test questions and I've included as many scenario-based questions as possible. And these scenario-based questions, you're going to have multiple right answers. All four answers might be correct, but you need to pick the answer that is the most correct. And when you understand, and that's basically going to come down to understanding the material in the way that ISC squared wants you to understand the material. I mean, most of us who are pursuing a CCSP, you know, if, you've, if you're pursuing a CCSP, you have already been exposed to cloud data. You've, you know, you have industry experience and that industry experience can either help you or hamper you. It can help you if you can think of it in terms of how ISC squared wants you to think. Uh, it can hamper you if you think well, this is how I've done it, and this is how I've seen it, and that's how it must be. So my best advice is to be able to take the test by thinking how ISC squared wants you to think for that test. And the test questions I've provided with the CCSP course, they are designed to help you get in that test taking mentality. They're, they're based on the test bank questions that I've seen that will have multiple correct answers. So it's a very good question. That's the one thing that'll, that I've seen trip people up on the exam is these uh, scenario-based questions, but that's very important. And you might find, uh, particularly, I find this from a lot of students, is when you get into the exam, it might take 15 minutes or so to start understanding how these questions are asked and what they want of you. And then once you get that mentality, you're good to go. But the questions that I have in the practice exams with the CCSP course and even the free practice exam that I provide on the website, uh, those all, there's many scenario-based questions as possible. There's still some questions that 
help you understand the vocabulary, but I've included as many of those scenario-based questions as I can. So, excellent question, and that's uh, definitely a great concern. All right, well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today for the CCSB study session. I hope this helped you, and I hope this uh, gives you a little bit of extra nudge in the right direction. This helps you, you know, refresh your mind, give you some extra topics to consider when it comes to taking the test and preparing yourself for the exam. If you have any further questions or if you're interested in the CCSB course, be sure to click the link in the description to go to the Cybercraft training website. We have a CCSB course. We also have a free practice exam, a 20 question practice exam that's available for anybody. And this study guide that I used here to help uh, guide the study session today, that's there for free, as well as a video that I've made for study tips that should help you, a few things to keep in mind as you're studying to help you get in that test taking mentality. So thanks again. Have a great Thursday. We're going to have these regularly, so I'll send out links uh, later. If you've signed up to the website, you'll receive links and you'll receive emails for when we have these study sessions. These are a regular occurrence. So have a great day and stay safe.